So not only is insulin stimulating the either direct uptake or the keeping of the glucose and activating other enzymes further down, like PFK1 I'd mentioned earlier, hexokinase, which is the first step of glucose, locking it into the cell, whether it's going to get burned or turned into glycogen, insulin activates that too. So it generally is promoting glucose glycolysis. At the same time, it's inhibiting the breakdown of fat. Now, there's two parts here of fat to talk about. Lipolysis, which is the breakdown of fat from the fat cells to be shared. And then there's the oxidation or the burning of that fat. They're not the same. When people say fat burning, they sometimes only are actually referring to the breakdown of the fat, which is more technically to be called lipolysis. Um, so there's two steps here. It's the lipolysis or the releasing of the fat. And then there's the burning of the fat, which is the oxidation part. That's when burning should be used most appropriately. Insulin inhibits both of those. It inhibits lipolysis and it directly inhibits fatty acid oxidation. So it doesn't want the fat to leave the fat cell. And even if there is some that's left the fat cell, it doesn't want the tissues like the muscle to burn the fat. So insulin is absolutely critical for understanding which fuel is going to be used. If insulin is high, it will both aggressively activate all of the glucose burning pathways and aggressively inhibit any of the fat breakdown and burning pathways. In contrast, if insulin is low, there is a much diminished signal to burn glucose and there's nothing to stop fat breakdown and burning. So now fat breakdown and burning is just going nonstop. It's going unchecked. There's nothing really to inhibit lipolysis. Other people want to invoke other little hormones here and there. And other can mat others do have an influence, but nothing matters if insulin is low or not there at all. This happens even if both are elevated. Insulin dictates which one is used. Now, with that point in mind, I, can, I wanted to be able to give you a real physiological example of this point. And diabetes is the perfect example, both type 1 diabetes and type 2. Of course, the difference with them, and there's far more different between type 1 and type 2 diabetes than there is similar. I will state this again, as I've stated it before. I think it's a tragedy that they're even put in the same family. The only thing they have in common is the high, di the high blood glucose. Everything else is profoundly different between them. They shouldn't be even lumped together. They're diseases of opposites. They're not diseases of similarities. With type 1 diabetes, there's too little insulin. With type 2 diabetes, there's too much. All right. Now let's talk about type 1 diabetes first because it provides the most extreme example here. And it's a perfect scenario where both glucose is high, the person is profoundly hyperglycemic, and guess what? Free fatty acids are also through the roof. They have both, they have extremely high levels of both substrates. So it's the perfect sort of case study here that I um, alluded to earlier. How do we reconcile this? And when there's no insulin, which one is the body using? So this diabetic body, again, tons of glucose, tons of fatty acids. The cell can't choose which one. And so who helps it decide it's insulin? And if insulin is present, then the cell would know, okay, I'm burning glucose. If insulin is absent, as it is in this case, even though both are available, both substrates, glucose and fats, insulin, if it's absent, like it is in the untreated type 1 diabetic, it can't stop burning fats. It can't stop. It's just burning fats like gangbusters. In fact, it starts to burn fats so much that it can't... So if you take a tissue like the liver where the liver doesn't need insulin for, say, glucose uptake, but again, it needs insulin to tell it what to do with the energy, it's burning so much fat that it starts to get to a threshold, if you will, and I'm describing this a bit imprecisely, but I think it's helpful nonetheless. Normally, a cell's only burning as much energy as it needs ATP, the main mo a molecule of energy that the cell actually that is actually kind of energetic for the cell to use to get work done. Whatever the cell wants to do, it's ATP that allows the cell to do it. So normally, this the burning of energy is demand-driven. The cell's saying, hey, I need this much ATP. And so the cell will say, okay, no problem. I'm going to burn this much fats or glucose to give you that much ATP. But if insulin is absent, firstly, the liver's primarily burning fat, but then it can't stop burning. There's nothing to really turn it off. And so even, so the cell, again, this is a little imprecise. 
it's met all of its energetic needs where the liver is saying, Hey, I'm, I'm full. I'm getting all the energy I need. Um, so now the cell, which still can't stop burning fat starts to turn it into ketones. So ketones are kind of this release valve where the liver cell is saying one, I don't need any more energy, but two, I can't stop burning fats for energy. And so three, I'm going to start changing this energy into something else that other parts of the body can use ketones particularly the, the 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 brain of course but every tissue every cell with mitochondria will gladly use ketones for fuel and of course in the case of the diabetic this is generally trying to make up for what is perceived to be a lack of glucose even though glucose is through the roof in the absence of insulin the cell can't really use it it doesn't know what to do with it so in the untreated type 1 diabetic, both glucose levels are high and fats are high. There's nothing to turn off the use of fats, so fats win. At the same time, there's nothing really to tell the cells to use the glucose because it's almost like the cells can't see it. It needs insulin to tell it what to do with that glucose. So the cell just sort of sees the glucose and says, yeah, sorry, I just don't know what to do with you. So don't come in. I'm not going to store you. You just keep circulating in the blood. Insulin hasn't come and told me what to do because there is no insulin. So this is, it should be generally proof positive of the importance and indeed critical aspect of insulin when it comes to understanding the Randall cycle. If people are trying to discuss the Randall cycle in the absence of insulin, uh, it doesn't work. Um, there's really true, no, there's no true understanding of the Randall cycle or this competition between substrates, fats and glucose. 